Okay, we're so glad to be back with Lou Pugliarisi. Uh, he's the CEO of APRIC, an energy policy research think tank in Washington, D.C. He's got so much going, so much on his plate, and yet he has time to talk with us. We're so delighted. Hi, Lou. Hi, Jay. Great to be here. So, uh, so we're going to divide this show in two parts. The first part is we're going to talk about isolationism, and, and we have um, named that part of the show, um, what is it, isolationism as a hidden cost of American energy independence which is really an important discussion these days because we don't think of the, the consequences of our foreign policy or non-foreign policy as the case may be. And so we ought to explore that, at least on this one, you know, drill down level of energy to see what effects our policy, our foreign policy is happening, ha having. And so, Lou, I, I'd like to ask you to give, give us your thoughts about that so we can examine oh. the, the trends that are going on. Yeah, so one of the interesting things, that I don't know how much of the audience really is following this, but if the United States and Canada and Mexico, you know, the North American production platform, we've talked about it before, is now a net exporter of oil and gas to the world market. So it's true that we import lots of crude oil and energy from different parts of the world, but we also export a lot of finished products, but uh, if you do the balances, North America, particularly in the U.S., is now a net exporter of oil and gas to the world market. Mm -hmm. And that's a good thing. In many ways, it creates a lot of uh, the North American production platforms worth about a trillion dollars a year, a quarter of the world's oil production, less than a quarter of the world's oil and gas uh, consumption. But one of the interesting uh, aspects of this is that, uh, and I think wrongly, lots of our political leaders and our last two presidents have the sense that the world beyond the United States is less important than it used to be. And uh, the Middle East, we don't need them as much as we used to, uh, that we're not as interconnected, at least the belief among our political leaders is we're not interconnected to the world and as dependent on the world as we used to be. I, I think this is wrong. This is wrong technically and also wrong as a matter of U.S. national security. Uh, the liberal order, if you call that, free trade, the growth of democracy, uh, is there in the world because the United States is there. We have two big oceans on each side of us, and that means we need allies. And I think... If we start to, I think I want to pull from some recent work by this French philosopher, that as the U.S. withdraws, the, what he calls the five kingdoms, begin to vie for global power. And this is Russia, China, Turkey, Iran, and radical Islam. Um, I, I think the other aspect of this is that... Uh, some of Trump's action, though, is really an extension of what Obama was doing. And, you know, the American people don't like to be engaged in endless wars, in, in endless uh, conflicts, in, the, uh, uh, in which there doesn't seem to be any immediate resolution. So, in a way, there's a kind of fatigue setting in, and this is adding to this view. So now... Um, uh, 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 but once again, I, I think it's, it's important not to take too kind of black and white view of this. The U.S. does, has engaged in very aggressive policy to counter the Russians in many respects. We, Trump actually uh, provided uh, lethal weaponry to the Ukrainians to deal with uh, the uh, Russian uh, invasion and intervention, something Obama refused to do. Uh, the U.S. has taken a relatively hard line on Iran, in fact, rejecting the nuclear agreement but also the pullback from uh, Syria is disturbing. The inability to uh, successfully conclude a trade agreement with our uh, non, let's say, authoritarian allies in the Pacific Rim, all these are adding to a sense of, uh, uh, I think, moving towards isolationism as we become more secure with our energy independence here at home. Well, um, 
let's let's look at that one by one and see how those countries um, could uh, you know affect our energy policy. If we go sideways with some of them, we're going to have a much uh, more significant effect on our energy policy and our our independence, our energy independence. So, for example, yeah, uh, you know, can we take them one by one? Let Let's take Russia. Sure. Let's assume for a moment that we are we are going to go sideways for one reason or another. Whether it's whether it's Trump, whether it's Russia, whether it's uh, you know a whole perception of isolationism or our worldview, collectively our worldview, and we are no longer friends. I mean, by any stretch, with Russia. So how does how does that get into our energy independence? So. If you think about Russia, I think the biggest uh, energy issue now is the so-called Nord Stream 2 pipeline. And in fact, both the Obama and the Trump administrations have argued to the Europeans that they should be quite cautious about this project. And if you know about this project, right now, Europe gets a substantial quantity of its gas, not as much as much people think. 30 to 40 percent from Russia. But most of this gas transits the, the, uh, the country of Ukraine. Right? Uh, under the Nord Stream 2 project, this uh, gas from Europe, I mean from Russia, would begin to land in the European continent on, on, in Germany by crossing the Baltic Sea and completely bypassing Ukraine. So, in one hand, it would provide a new transit route for gas supply to Europe. On the other hand, it would further isolate uh, Ukraine from uh, the European community, uh, which today is a major bulwark against uh, Russian expansion and influence in uh, the European continent. And I think both, you know, both, you could argue both Obama and Trump have a, a made a strong pitch to the Russians to uh, go cautious, cautious with this project, not to proceed. The Russian behavior is inadequate, but the but the Europeans and the, the Europeans have been reluctant to accept this view, and the Russians also see this as a way to continue their influence in Europe. Well, let me, let me, uh, let me interrupt by uh, just asking this. Yeah. So there's, there's obviously a, a strategy here of um, isolating U Ukraine, of depriving Ukraine of uh, having that gas go through Ukraine. Um, and, the re and the revenue from it, yes. Yeah, that's an attack in, in some way on Ukraine. Uh, but can, yeah. can you tell us, you know, assuming that Russia would ultimately like to, uh, you know, take Ukraine over, so that it is no longer a buffer between NATO and, and Russia. How does, how does bypassing Ukraine with the supply of gas to Germany by way of the Baltics, how does that help Russia, you know, ultimately deprive Ukraine, marginalize its economy, uh, you know, convince its people, its government, they have to surrender to domination by Russia. How does that, can you connect that up? Yeah, so I, I think, I think it's a, it's a, first it will deny the Ukrainians the much needed revenue. It is, to some extent, the Ukrainians do have some leverage over the Russians. Now, you could argue the Russians have leverage over them in many respects, but from a point of view of Russia's access, Russia's access to the Western European gas market, Ukraine is essential for them. It is the only major route. Yes, there are alternative routes for some gas supplies through Turkey, the so-called, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, blue stream projects to come across the Baltic through Turkey and up to the southern quarter. But Ukraine is the bulk of U.S. gas supplies that come from Russia, generate a lot of revenue for Russia, and also generate revenue for Ukraine. The Russians are spending an enormous amount of money with the help of the West Germans, to build an alternative route. And I think the U.S. and some of the Eastern European uh, nation states have argued in Brussels, look, this is a mistake. The Russians are not stable enough, not reliable enough. You shouldn't do this. And I think you could argue that U.S. 
uh, U.S. gas supply, which is becoming much more prolific in the form of LNG, represents a counterweight to this, that this LNG is available to the Europeans. But for many reasons, the Europe, Europeans are not feeling comfortable enough with the U.S. alliance, and second, I think, uh, not feeling uh, threatened enough about what the Russians can do to them long term. Mm -hmm. So this is, sounds so like you could if, argue. if Russia wants to build a relationship, an economic relationship, a relationship of um, oh, economic necessity with Germany and Western Europe, then this, is, this aids that. If Russia wants to get into a position where American uh, energy supplies and gas, whatnot, from U.S. to, uh, uh, to, to Western Europe is not as important, uh, is, is, you know, is under competition uh, from Russian gas, they're doing that. So it sounds to me like this is, this all, the, our isolationism, uh, our treatment of our former allies uh, in Western Europe, is, is, and, and Russia's uh, moving into the vacuum, so to speak, is changing the way, uh, changing our influence and our energy market in Western Europe in favor of the Russians. Am I right about that? Yeah, of course, it's always, it's never quite black and white. The Russians are, I mean, the, some of the Eastern European countries have built LNG receiving facilities. And we, yes, the Russians will benefit from this project. Uh, but the benefit from that is not, it's not, it's not disappearing overnight. The U.S. will have some capacity to provide supplies as a leverage. So, and the Europeans do have a highly integrated pipeline market now. So, yes, it's a kind of mixed bag. But basically, you know, my, our view is, or my view is, the behavior of Russia does not suggest it's a reliable partner. And that the Europeans should feel confident enough to tell the Russians, look, this is probably not a bad project. It probably makes a lot of sense. But, you know, you guys are not... You guys are not giving us the confidence that uh, you want to be a stable neighbor. Mm -hmm. You're engaged in all this kind of uh, uh, disturbing and uh, disruptive behavior in Ukraine and other parts of Eastern Europe. And so we're not going to proceed with this project. And by the way, we don't need to proceed with this project. Mm -hmm. we, can, we can draw our supplies from other parts of the world, including the U.S. So why is Germany and doing so, this? Germany is overriding that kind of objection. Germany, uh, in its self-interest, sees this as a, a benefit to Germany. Call it a nationalism of sorts. Uh, you know, every country on its own, that's, that's, that'd be Trump's philosophy. And they're saying, it serves us. You know, don't, don't tell us what to do. It serves us. We want to have this pipeline come through the Baltic and serve us. This will give us um, whatever comfort we require. It will give us sufficient comfort to you know, spend the infrastructure, and to be the gateway to the rest of Western Europe for Russian gas. Yeah. Oddly enough, you know, the Europeans have spent a lot of money on renewables. Uh, they're trying to wind down their use of coal. Their own domestic supplies of natural gas are declining. Uh, you know, different parts of Germany are, I mean, in the Netherlands, there's an anti-fossil fuel uh, trend and element that's limiting their development to produce more North Sea oil and gas. Uh, the onshore in the United Kingdom, the uh, uh, interest in proceeding where there seem to be some interesting potential to do hydraulic fracturing continues to have a lot of opposition. So this is viewed as a way to substitute for declining supply of indigenous resources uh, throughout the European continent. So you say it's, it's a hidden cost, Lou. How does that work? What, what, the hidden, the changes yeah. so in the hidden cost that work? is. So the hidden cost is, I think that in, if you went back to the 70s or the 80s where the U.S. was very dependent on, on imports, in which we got the formation of the International Energy Agency, and there was an engagement with the Allies, look, we're all in this together, right? Uh, the U.S. and you know, we have to stick together. The alliance is absolutely essential, and when we when we do that, we should come to a joint agreement 
on our mutual energy security because we are obligated to each other if there's a major oil disruption, if there's a major disruption in supply to help each other under the International Energy Agency. And, you know, I agree there's, it's, it's not exactly a black and white. There's a gray area here. But I would have, I think in an era where the U.S. was more dependent, uh, we would have been in a position with the Europeans to say, look, let, let's roll this out for a while. Let's see how this plays out. Let's see if we can get the Russians to behave a little bit better before you proceed with this project. And we did do that. If you remember when we had the, uh, the uh, sanctions in Russia, and after, uh, actually this is right after uh, Jimmy Carter and the Reagan administration when the uh, invasion of Afghanistan took place. And we, we limited the supplies of gas from Russia. And, well, let's uh, let's take a short break, Lou. We'll come back, yeah. and I would like I would like to talk mm -hmm. about how this works on a parallel basis uh, in China. Also, one of our great sure. competitors or rivals, as you as you like. We'll be right back after right. a short break. Lou Pudirisi of Eprint. Aloha and welcome to At the Crossroads. I'm your host, Keisha King. You can catch me every Wednesday, alive at five. I'll see you there. Aloha, I'm Wendy Lowe, and I'm coming to you every other Tuesday at 2 o'clock, live from Think Tech Hawaii. And on our show, we talk about taking your health back. And what does that mean? It means mind, body, and soul. Anything you can do that makes your body healthier and happier is what we're going to be talking about. Whether it's spiritual health, mental health, fascia health, beautiful smile health, whatever it means, let's take healthy back. Aloha. Aloha, this is Winston Welch. I am your host of Out and About, where every other week, Mondays at 3, we explore a variety of topics in our city, state, nation, and world, and uh, events, organizations, the people that fuel them. It's a really interesting show. We welcome you to tune in, and we welcome your suggestions for shows. Um, you got a lot of them out there, and we have an awesome a studio here where we can get your ideas out as well. So I look forward to you tuning in every other week where we've got some great guests and great topics. You're going to learn a lot. You're going to come away inspired like I do. So I'll see you every other week here at three o'clock on Monday afternoon. Aloha. Okay, we're back. Uh, we're back with Lou Pugliarisi of Eprink. We are having this most interesting discussion uh, entitled um, Isolationism. Uh, is a hidden cost of American uh, energy independence, okay? And we talked about Europe, and there's more to talk about there because that's an ongoing issue and it's very dynamic. But it's, it's also worth talking about uh, what's happening in our relationship with China, which has degraded uh, over the past year or two. Um, and now we are having tariff battles and trade battles and we're having tech battles and cyber terrorism battles and is a real friction going on between the U.S. And, uh, and China, which is really not so good. And that's part of this isolationist mentality we have in the White House and also in, you know, in the country, uh, in, in the base anyway, yeah. in the country. And so, uh, you know, can you describe our relationship with China on energy and how this changes yeah. it, Lou? Before we get to that, I think we should sort of describe a little bit how energy independence what you know how it changes the perception versus the reality for a second historically the right way to think about the sort of energy security problem facing the united states was we lived in a world in which particularly for oil and gas which is extremely important to the national economy of the united states we lived in a world where there was a concentration of low-cost resources among unstable parts of the world and that posed this was mostly the Middle East, but not just the Middle East. And that posed two risks to the United States. One, a relatively few number of players could get together and raise the price and extract wealth from the United States. Or two, they could go out of business for a while, spike the world price, right, and cause a, a lot of damage to the national economy. Now, that actually hasn't changed that much as we're a net exporter, but it does make it better. If we're a net exporter and the price goes up, 
theoretically, our government could just recycle the money. Mm -hmm. It's not like they're extracting wealth. We're actually getting a lot of the wealth into the country. Mm -hmm. We're not paying it to foreigners. We're paying it to ourselves. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that has created a sense with Congress and administration, look, why do we have to deal with all these crazy people in the Middle East and other suppliers in the world? You know, they're a pain in the neck. Uh, you know, it's too much effort. Uh, we have a big Navy. Let's stop doing that and because we don't need to anymore. And that sort of flops over into Asia as well. Now, I think it's a little different than with the Europeans in that. Yes, I would say if I were making a criticism of Trump, what he... China is a problematic player in many ways, right? But the way to deal with China is not to disengage from our alliances in the Pacific Rim, but actually to strengthen them. Because China is going to be much more receptive to changes in policy and to becoming a responsible member of the Pacific Rim if the U.S. is in a strong alliance with Japan and Indonesia, South Korea, and uh, and I, I do think that the sort of isolationist or the America first behavior towards Asia is particularly troublesome because it makes it harder for us to address these central threats from China. So on the other hand, China is a growing user of commodities. It's not a major exporter of, of commodities. It is a huge industrial finished goods export economy. It needs large supplies of oil and gas from the world. And part of the reasons China has become more outward looking, more aggressive, is because those sea lanes of communications and those things, uh, they feel that a certain threat from that. So you have the build out of the Chinese Navy. But we should not forget. We and our allies in the Pacific Rim have a much different value structure than the Chinese. Right? Yeah. We basically adhere to democratic principles, uh, principles of open and free trade, open discourse. This is not what's happening in China under uh, Xi. Well, it's interesting that if, if the U.S. goes isolation on, on this and creates the vacuum, just, just as there is a vacuum in Europe and Russia is falling into it, um, the vacuum in, um, you know, in Asia, China is falling into it, and, it, it, and China, it, it's, an easy, it's an easy trip for China to take. But, but query, at the same time, and we talked about this in the break, at the same time, you have one belt, one road. You have China using its economic uh, twist to, um, you know, to, to influence all the countries along the one belt, one road, all the way to Europe and Africa. And so uh, I guess what I would like to know is, uh, this, does the One Belt, One Road initiative um, give China influence to obtain resources, including energy resources, from all the countries along the way, all the way, say, to Africa, all the way through the Middle East? Does that give China an, another market from which to obtain consumable energy? So in theory, yes. Yeah. But in practice, the Chinese, this is where the opening is for the, for the sort of liberal democracies of the Pacific Rim. The Chinese have mishandled many of these Belt and Road initiatives. And the countries, even India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, are beginning to look at their relationship with China in a more suspicious or more, uh, let's say, uh, skeptical manner because some of these projects have been highly uneconomic. They have left the countries with large uh, debt that they can't easily, they can't easily service. Uh, it's quite interesting if you look in Venezuela now, the new so-called interim president, Guaido, right, who is challenging Maduro. The Chinese and Russians now are, are Yes, they're supporting Maduro, but they are also reaching out to him and saying, you know, when you take over, don't forget, you owe us a lot of money. <laughs> sure, <laughs> so, sure. <laughs> so they, they, <laughs> but I, I do think, once again, there's an opening. I don't think, I think it's unfair to say, well, you know, Trump is just some crazy cowboy who has uh, 
as I say, most of my problems with Trump are more style than substance. Mm -hmm. He is trying to do different things that make sense. He just doesn't have the kind of uh, sort of integrated strategy and selling that strategy to our alliance, uh, you know, our, our allies in the Pacific that I, I would like to see. It sounds like there's really a, a general principle involved here, and I, I would ascribe to it, yeah. namely that, that when you engage, when the United States engages with the world, as we have mostly since World War II, where we've set the, 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 the global order, so to speak, the liberal global order in the world, uh, a, a moral, uh, an order of essential kindness and caring, uh, that, that order has returned to us. It returns, it returns economically. We have economic benefits out of being a nice guy. Engagement yields economic benefits. But then you say, well, we, we've decided not to engage. We've decided to isolate ourselves. We've decided you know, to withdraw from, all, from being a leader in, 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 wor in the world order and not to set the standard anymore. When we do that, it seems to me, and the economics of energy is only one element, it seems to me that, that there are economic penalties to pay across the board, energy and other things, uh, that we lose the economic benefit of being a world leader. Engagement has a value. Engagement has an economic return. Not I, engagement. I agree. And I I agree, and I, once again, I don't want to overdo it. I don't want to overdo it because I do think I can point to, for example, the U.S.-Japan cooperation on LNG is a very effective program that's going to show the reliability of the U.S. as a supplier of uh, new supplies of clean energy or cleaner energy throughout the Pacific Rim. Uh, the, uh, you know, a lot of the work we're doing at NATO with our allies I mean, I think you have to step back and think about this very carefully. We have deployed troops and equipment throughout Eastern Europe. We are uh, engaged with uh, Japan, South Korea, and some of our other allies in the Pacific on strength in uh, uh, political military cooperation and energy cooperation. And so part of this is, but you know, if you're also going to be the moral leader, you have to step up on human rights you know, the, the, de the detainment and the isolation of the Uyghurs in China, the growing sort of autocratic tendencies of Xi Jinping. I mean, these, you need to sort of call them out on this thing. And I think that that's, that is a missing part of U.S. foreign policy. Well, uh, that uh, actually like opens to, to my last things. question to you, Lou. My last yeah. question is if, if, if I made you, <laughs> if I made you, the president. If I made you the American government, you know, I, I'm working up to that. Uh, what would you do here right now today in 2019 in order to, in order to take advantage of our, um, our possibilities here in the world? Yeah, so I, I think, you know, part of what's missing is a coherence to the policy, right? I don't, I don't think it's bad to sit down with the South Koreans and Japanese and say, look, you should pick up more of the cost of the base. Actually, that's been going on for a while. I think part of the thing is to begin to give our allies a sense of our predictability, that we have a long-run vision of where we want to be and where we want them to be, that we're in this together, that, uh, you know, this America First stuff, yes, of course, U.S. is pursuing its own interests. But the pursuit of U.S. interests are recognized as tied to the success of our long-term allies, particularly in the Pacific. It's very important. Uh, you know, and, and, and this, and, you know, the U.S. isn't by all standards in the world an enormous economic success story. You well, know, we, Europe today. Uh, well, I, I just want to say that from your lips to, to God's ears, Lou, uh, <laughs> you know, that's the kind of thinking we should all be engaged in, and, and yeah. uh, we, have to, we have to recreate, if you will, um, the kind of engagement we used to have. We, we should go forward. We, we are still the greatest country on earth, uh, and we have to uh, right. connect up with all the other uh, countries in the world and, and, and take leadership, and it will inure to our ex lasting benefit. Yeah, and I think, actually, the one thing that needs to happen now 
is we need to find a mechanism to engage a lot of brain power in the U.S., with our allies in Asia and in Europe and Latin America, and begin to think about, okay, what does the world order look like, need to look like in the future? Uh -huh. What do we need to transmit in terms of information and the building blocks to the next generation? Uh -huh. We can't sort of just say, well, we have despair over the turmoil in American foreign policy, because actually it's not, you know, it's it's got a lot of good features to it. It's a question of giving it some more coherence, and sort of building the capability and uh, understanding, educating the American people, so as the next administrations come into into power, that they begin to grasp some of these things. Well, Lou, you know, this is a thread I'd like to cover going forward. There are so many things yeah. to discuss, so many uh, in implications to connect the dots, yeah. and uh, I hope we can do that in the shows coming soon. Uh, Absolutely. There, we, are, we are loaded. Our plate is full. Uh, Lou Pugliarici, <laughs> the CEO of EPRING. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay, Jay, thanks so much. Aloha. <laughs>